Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Really nice to see you. Uh, very, very happy to be back at Slush, especially this time with Arthur. Uh, my name is Paul Murphy. I'm a partner at Lightspeed based in London. Uh, just a real quick uh, bit about Lightspeed for those that don't know. Uh, we have actually, we're a Silicon Valley based fund, but we've been investing in Europe uh, since 2007. We have over 30 companies now um, in Europe. Uh, and um, yeah, we're investing in pretty much every sector. Uh, and every stage. Um, we're talking about AI today, and I think it's important to put some context around that from our perspective. We actually have been investing in AI for nearly a decade. We have uh, about 50 companies um, and have invested over a billion dollars into the category. And that context is relevant because uh, when we met Arthur and his co-founders, we, thank you, we immediately fell in love with the vision of Mistral. Um, and so I thought that the best place to, to start would be to ask you, Arthur, to tell us a little bit about what you're building at Mistral. Well, thank you very much, uh, Slush, for the invitation. Thank you, Paul, as well. Um, so, yeah, we started Mistral uh, six months ago uh, with Guillaume and Timothée. And our vision was that we wanted to make the foundational models a bit differently from the other companies. Uh, we've been in the field for a, almost a decade now, and we've seen it go from a cat and dog detector to something that is very close to being human-like intelligent, or at least looks like it. And we knew that with a very dedicated team, we could develop uh, state-of-the-art models very, very quickly, and we could actually take the field into something that, is, that would be more open, where we would, would give more access to developers so that they could specialize the models, make them their own, make them as small as possible to solve their task. And for us, the good way of doing it and the good way of starting that was to ship the best open source models, create models that would be very easy to, to use by individual developers, and from then on, build onto an enterprise play to sell a platform that allows developers to take large language models and to make them their own, to, to create some differentiation on the application they're making. And that's a differentiation which is currently hard to do when you only access APIs of a couple of providers. But if you have a deep access to the models, you can create things that are much more interesting. And this is what we want to enable. So when we, we led your seed round, it wasn't that long ago. You told us that your first thing you were going to do was to build your 7B model. And then I think it was, it was like three months from when we signed the docs on that round, uh, we got our message saying, hey, we're ready, uh, it's ready. And it was faster than we had expected. It was already incredibly ambitious. I'm just, I think everyone's probably wondering how you did, how you did that so quickly. Well, I think the secret is to have a, a good team. Uh, so we were joined by our first employees, uh, dozens of them at the beginning of June, and nobody took holidays. Uh, we, we created the whole, what we call the machine learning ops system. So. That's actually very simple. You, you need to create a very good training code base. You need to create a very good inference uh, code base uh, to, to deploy the models. You need to be able to evaluate the models. And the one thing you do need the most, and where we actually dedicated 80% of the team on uh, for three months, is to have some very good data sets. So we, we went to the open web, to public domain knowledge, curated it so that we could just get the best of it, filtered it did everything to get something very good, did some work around how to better optimize the models, and combine all of this, uh, and then train the model to get the 7B, and we continue doing it uh, with the new models we'll be soon announcing. When you say it's fairly easy, I think maybe some people would disagree with you on that, but it, I, you definitely made it look easy. Uh, I think that's true. Um, so I'm curious. Uh, the community you know, was, has been very engaged with 7B models since you released it. I think it was you know, trending on Hugging Face for multiple days, top, you know, top, top models. Um, what kinds of things have you seen that have been interesting so far from the community? So we've seen, I think, thousands of um, der derivative work. So uh, developers that took Mistral 7B and fine-tuned it on their task or on their data sets to make it special. So we've seen new capabilities, so like longer context, uh, better instruction following capacities, uh, we've seen uh, like new topics, so we've seen like occult specialized models able to talk about uh, post-test experience and the like, much better than what Mistral 7B was able to do before. So many kind of 
different applications, uh, some of them useful, some of them uh, just funny. Um, we've seen integration in a lot of LLM open source projects. So the open source world around generative AI is pretty, is, is pretty involved already. So you have retrieval augmentation systems, you have projects that allow to deploy the models on your laptop, you have all of these things, and they adopted Mistral 7B very quickly. And I think it was, the field was really missing an actor that would produce the best open source models and actively engage with the community, and that's what we, we, uh, we, are, we are enabling. Okay, and so now the 7B is out there, what comes next? So we have um, nothing announced yet, but we, we do have things in-house that we'll be announcing before the end of the year. Uh, new models, uh, new techniques, uh, and obviously the beginning of a platform, so we're actively working on the product, uh, we'll be soon offering uh, hosting capacities for our models uh, with very fast uh, inference mo uh, capabilities, and yeah, that's for uh, very soon. Okay, well, watch the space. Um, so you're also, while you're doing all this incredibly, what I think most people would think of as quite challenging technical work, you're also building a company. And I, I know that's not easy, I haven't done it myself before. Um, what's keeping you up at night right now? What's your biggest headache? Um, so hiring is obviously a very big challenge. I think the only reason why we got there so fast is because we hired the, the best engineers and the best scientists in the world. It's a very competitive landscape. Uh, Europe is full of talent, especially the junior ones, uh, and so we, we are, uh, this is some, like a very big preoccupation for us, uh, I'm constantly working on it. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is like creating the community, engaging with it. Uh, so we started with, the, with Mistral 7B, but we really need to, uh, yeah, well, facilitate the life of our users, uh, have them engage, have, facilitate upstream contribution. Uh, facilitate the emergence of ideas that we could help enable. Uh, so that's another thing. We have a lot of, um, I guess, policy matters uh, that we did not ex expect, but obviously this is an agenda that you don't select. Um, there's, uh, we, we, so there's, there's different tracks you have in the yeah. US, you have in the EU. Um, we've been uh, vocal about the fact that we wanted to have hard regulation on the product side because it's very important. And we see ourselves as the provider of tools and a big enabler of compliance for the application makers. So we've been saying that uh, constantly, and, and, and we've seen like, the debate uh, progress on these topics. And so this is something that yeah, we're very keen on trying to enable from a technical perspective, because it's important that you have technical founders that participate in that discussion. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that has kept me up at night uh, for, for a while. And I think you know, the ambition was certainly to be able to build something that could rival other large companies like OpenAI. And I'm just curious, what do you view as a differentiating philosophy or approach to companies like OpenAI? Yeah, I think a differentiating philosophy is that we really target the developer space. And we really think that when you're making a, an application that you want to put into production, you do want to have several specialized models that are as many chips, you should see them as chips that you assemble in an application. And it's actually not easy to make a very good chip for the use case you want. So you can start with a very big model with thousands of billions, well, with uh, hundreds of billions of parameters. It's going to solve your task, maybe, but you could actually have something which is 100 times smaller. And when you make an, a, a production application that goes at scale and target a lot of users, you want to make the choices that lowers the latency, lower the costs, uh, and leverage the actual proprietary data that you may have. And this is something that I think that that's not the, the, the topic of our competitors that are really targeting like multi-usage, very large models, AGI. We're taking a very much, much more pragmatic approach in enabling super useful application today uh, that would be cost efficient, that would be very low latency, and that would enable strong differentiation through uh, proprietary data. Okay. And you've talked, I think another key difference, you've talked a lot about open source as being a core part of your DNA. Um, and I think the question I sort of wanted to ask, uh, Arthur, by the way, wouldn't look at these questions beforehand, so he wasn't expecting this one. But I understand the concept of open source software. I think we all do. We see the code, you kind of can take it, modify it, um, and use it. But in the world of AI and, and models, the concept of open source just feels like it's maybe a bit different because actually some things you do keep for yourself or you have to. What does open source mean in the context of LLMs and AI? 
So we don't really call them open source. So the, the models we provide are open weight. So I think it's important to like, keep a good distinction between the, like, the terminology we are using for software and the terminology mm -hmm. we are using for models. If you provide the weights of the models, you're enabling modification. You're not necessarily enabling like, full understanding of what's going on. But even if you do provide full transparency on the data sets and training, you don't know what's going on because it's, it's a bit opaque by design. So, it's an empirical science. When you create a model, the only way to verify that the model is doing what you expect is to measure it with, with evaluation. This is something we'll be enabling. And then it's to modify it with some signal coming from either humans or maybe machines to, to modify the model. So really, the modification part is super important for differentiation. And we are taking this approach. There's a full open source approach, which I think is very valid as well for science, in which you disclose your data sets, you disclose everything. That, I think that's, that's something that we would strive toward at some point, but obviously it's super competitive, and the data set part is very hard to, to obtain. It's also very capital intensive. You need a lot of GPUs. So right now we're taking a balanced approach in between what we uh, open, what the, the open ways we provide, the things we keep for ourselves to, to get a competitive uh, edge. And this is going to be a dynamic play, and we expect it to, to evolve with time and with technology. OK. And then does the, does the open weight approach help with other challenges, like biases and control? Yeah, yeah. So it helps with basically two things. The first thing is that you can modify the biases. You can have like a strong and fine uh, modification capabilities on the editorial tone, on the orientation and alignment of the model. So we allow alignment of your own models to your own values. And those can slightly differ. Um, so like fine control of biases goes through fine deep access to, to models. So that's the first thing. The second thing it allows, and we've seen it uh, with active engagement of uh, the AI safety community in particular around open source models, it allows to have better interpretability because you can see the inner activations of the, of the models. And, and that tells you things about what's happening. Uh, about why the model is taking a decision and not another. So why is it outputting a word and not another? And so in the in interpretability world, it's also super useful. It's also, and I guess the last thing is that it's very useful to do red teaming because you have a deep access to, to the model and so you can try to verify the, the, the part of it which are a bit failing or behaving unexpectedly. And these are things that you can then correct very similarly to uh, what we've been doing in the open source software for security, cyber security and the like. Okay, and then what, I mean, what is sort of, what do you view as at stake here? You know, why is this, is this, in other words, is this a business advantage for Mistral or is it something more fundamental that you see as almost a responsibility? So it's both a business advantage because we allow further customization and differentiations and it's a very mature market and we expect that on the application space, the one actors, the actors that are going to survive and create some value are the ones that will be able to strongly differentiate themselves. And so they would need deep access to models. So that's a, a business differentiator. Then there's a bit of an ideological differentiator in the sense that I've been contributing to open source for 10 years, Guillaume and Timothée as well. We really think that AI has been accelerated by open science, by the circulation of knowledge. And that's how we went in 10 years from something very, very uh, well, interesting, but that would just detect boats and to so something that actually uh, will speak the human language. So this has been allowed because you had big tech labs, you had the academia as well. That was all of them were communicating at conferences every every year, and and information would circulate and that accelerated things. And suddenly, in 2020, OpenAI decided to stop publishing, and it was followed by its competitors uh, very closely after. And so ever since 2022, we haven't seen like major advances in LLM publicly uh, announced. And so we've seen, currently there's like new architectures that are used internally by our competitors and that are not available out there. Mm -hmm. This is something we will correct very soon. Okay, great. Um, so I want to shift focus now, talk about something you mentioned earlier, which is regulation. And it's a, a topic you kind of can't avoid, I think, if you're thinking about AI. Um, a lot of focus within Europe and, and in the UK, um, and I think you were at the Safety Summit in the UK, the AI Safety Summit um, last month. There's a lot of ideas out there, and I think, um, you know, curious to hear your view as to what should be the priority. How should regulation be prioritized and instrumented? Yes, yeah, so I think it's quite interesting. It's a very interesting topic for me, and, and we've been, uh, yeah, we've been contributing ideas. The one thing that I would start with is that we've been 
talking about regulation and safety and mixing concepts very heavily. So there's a matter of product safety, which is answering the question of you deploy a diagnosis assistant in the hospital, you want it to be safe, you want to be able to measure whether the decision it's making is actually sound, is actually correct. So that's, that's what we call product safety. That's something you have when you buy a car, you have product safety of your car, and it should very much be similar for applications. So that's one thing. And AI, to some extent, creates new problems because you have models that are not deterministic, and so they behave in a potentially unexpected way. So it's useful to refine the hard laws that we have around uh, product safety regulation. Now, there's another topic that came up, which is national security. So the question of whether the LLMs that we're training, the LLM that everyone is training, is spreading too much knowledge. So when you have access to LLM, you're effectively able to educate yourself on many topics. And this is something that is a concern for different actors, because you could have like small groups that are deemed bad, that could use this knowledge to do bad things. So this, is, this has been at the a central topic, especially in the US. Um, we're still lacking a lot of, there's absolutely no public evidence that LLMs are facilitating anything. So we're really, we're, we've been advocating for, for some empirical grounding of the discussion, and this is something that's currently very much lacking. And then there's a third thing, which is kind of mixed with all of this, uh, with, with the two first, which is existential risks. So knowing whether the technology we're making is effectively on an unbounded exponential that will end up destroying us because as every exponential, it kind of breaks the limits at some point and, and that's, well, it becomes uh, ill-defined, as we say in mathematics. So this is something that for us is it's very much science fiction, that's empirical evidences. So what we've been saying is that we should really focus on the first topic, which is imminent. It's something that is, we do need to have product safety on AI because it's, it's going to, otherwise it's going to break trust in the technology we're making. And so we want to enable that. On the second part, we are lacking empirical evidence, but I think this is something that we should monitor closely. Knowledge, historically knowledge, the spreading of knowledge has always had more benefits than, uh, than, than drawbacks. And we are, AI is no different in that respect, but still it's something that, that could do with monitoring because it's really a new technology. On the third aspect of AGI and, and, and the like, and, and the fact that you could have an autonomous system that would go out of control, this is something that we are not at ease discussing because we really think that as scientists we are lacking evidence of any existential risk and we think that it pollutes the discussion on the first aspect which is super important. Yeah, and so if I just kind of make sure I understand this right, the, the view is that the application layer is probably the one that has the most responsibility in terms of safety at least to consumers or end users, whoever that is, businesses, but that perhaps the models could provide that as a feature or functionality but it's not the responsibility of the model to ensure that the ultimate data transmitted is itself safe. Exactly, so we think that the correct way of putting some pressure on the model providers uh, like us is to effectively say that any application which is deployed, and that includes the application that we deploy, uh, should, be, should meet a certain number of safety standards. So they should do what they're expected to do. And if you do that, then that means that the application providers will be looking at model providers that are controllable enough, that can give some form of guarantees, that can give some evaluation tools around the fact that they're controllable and that they do what they're expected to do. So you have some form of second order pressure that is put, you put pressure on the application layer, and that puts a market pressure on the foundational model developers. And that's the correct way of making a healthy competition in making the most controllable models, in making the best evaluation tools, in making the best guardrailing tools. And we think that it's a much better way of doing it than applying directly a pressure on the foundational model layer, because if you do that, well, you're, you're in an ill-defined territory, because you're trying to control something which is, by design, super multipurpose, very yeah. akin to a programming language. So you can't really regulate the programming language, because you can do anything with it. And so really there's a problem of definition, and then there's an operational problem of the fact that if you put some heavy pressure on that layer, you're effectively um, favoring the big actors that have yeah. a lot of compliance capabilities, and you're, you're making it harder for startups with innovative ideas to, to come up and compete. And so this, like, foundational models is a bad proxy for uh, market capture, and so we believe that 
applying the regulation pressure on the application layer is the one thing to do, because that's going to foster competition and provide a safer world. Do you think that there's a role for an, you know, an IAEA kind of like organization to exist that helps to enforce or provide this guidance or regulation? So, yes, I think um, this kind of regulation, if we need to monitor, I think we, we do need to have empirical evidence of what's happening in the space. And we need to monitor the product side safety. And one way of doing it is to enforce that we have very, very independent uh, organisms that actually monitor these things. And when I say independent, I mean that we should be very cautious of, of preventing pressure and regulatory capture of these things. So setting standards, but ensuring that no big actor is basically writing the standards themselves. Yeah. And so what that means is that if we, are, if we, if we need to have this, this form of organisms, they need to be very well funded, probably state funded, and being completely screened from pressure from the industry. Okay. So now I want to shift. You know, I think the regulation debate is largely, uh, many of the debates in AI are, tend to sort of skew somewhat negative. So let's dream for a second. Like, how can AI make our lives better? What do you see as the utopian future with AI? So I think the, um, there's, so there's many verticals in which uh, AI and like interacting with machines, with natural language, carry a lot of value. Uh, so healthcare is going to be completely changed by AI because you, you will be able to interact uh, with empathic beings uh, that are actually super well grounded on statistics, and that's really what you are expecting from medicine. So we expect that AI is going to empower uh, physicians to be much better at what they're doing and to make better decisions. Um, education is also a super interesting topic. Uh, personalization of education, we know that it's super important to uh, take the most, most potential of, of human beings. And having some, like your individual teacher being an assistant, this is going to change a lot of things, especially in the global south. Um, so that's two things. Generally speaking, this is going to change the way we work. So it's a way, the fact that it can interact with unstructured knowledge and that it can do well, act as if, well, a bit imitate the boring task of, uh, of your daily life. This is going to enable more space for creative thinking. So we will be able to think more creatively, and that's going to unleash, I think, a new society very soon. And if you think about some of the more existential risks we face in the world, like climate change, do you think that something like that can be addressed, or at least improved? Yes, so I think this is a frontier which, which hasn't been completely addressed yet. But this is really a promise of having better models. The fact that if you, if you have some ways of reasoning around a pool of science, where you can enable scientists to come up with new ideas, you can potentially unlock very precise things like, create, like in chemistry, in accelerating uh, chemical reaction so that you emit less CO2, for instance. These things like material science, chemistry, fusion, nuclear fusion as well. All of these locks that we have and that are that we basically need to break in order to address climate change. Well, I mean, that's one of the ways you can address climate change. Obviously, the one way is also to reduce consumption. But the, the, these things, we, we think that AI is going to be an enabler of, of, of breaking these locks. It's not going to be an easy task. Uh, there's still many things to invent. And we think that going through the open science part, uh, fostering the, 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 keeping fostering the AI community that drove the field forward for 10 years is, great, is super important to break these locks. Okay, that's great. So I think I want to come back to, to Europe sort of for our, our last question because we're, we're out of time. Um, how, I mean, I think the fact that the company is being built in Europe is very important to you. It was obvious to you and your co-founders when we invested. Um, how important do you think it is for the industry that we have uh, a European champion emerge in, in the field of AI? So the technology is AI, generative AI is, is really a wave. You can, it's going to change society quite significantly. And in Europe, we have a choice of either being on top of the wave and driving the technology forward, or just looking at it happening in the US uh, and in China. And we think that in order to shape the technology to our values and to the way we think about democracy, about society, we need to have very strong technological actors that are able to drive the field forward, make proposals, um, 
both in terms of policy and in terms of technology. And so that's why we believe it's super important that actors, that we have strong actors in Europe. Great. Thank you so much, Arthur. Really appreciate it. Amazing.